Thank you for coming to the first lecture in our Lunch and Learn series. I'm really excited to see so many people here, even on a really snowy, not great day. So thanks for coming. Um, so I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, Dan Pompriand. Wow, that was pretty good. Is that great. right? Yeah, excellent. And he's going to talk to us today about the mysterious artifact at the bottom of Smith Pond. So thank you for being here, Dan, and I'll let you take it away. Well, I'm glad you all made it today on such a snowy day, and I hope your travels were we're safe getting here. Um, my name is, is, is Dan Pontbrand. Uh, uh, I currently work at L.L. Bean uh, part-time, uh, mostly working in the Outdoor Discovery School and doing things like uh, working with uh, L.L. Bean. But prior to working at L.L. Bean, my job was a ranger with the National Park Service, and I spent 31 years with uh, the National Park Service working in national parks all over the United States. And uh, I retired as the chief ranger at the Isle Royal National Park. So I, in, during my park service career, I took the grand tour of all of uh, many of the national parks uh, in the western states. Spent most of my career in the west. Um, one of the places I spent uh, was at Olympic National Park 15 years. And uh, there's a book right over there on the counter that uh, I wrote about Olympic National Park and a case that I worked at there, which has turned out to be a fascinating case. Um, in one's uh, park service career, it's seldom that you ever run across a mystery like that one with uh, that much intrigue and that much adventure. That's high adventure scuba diving if there ever was, <laughs> and that's what that book's all about. So if you get a chance to read uh, that little book, there's a little bit of plug for my book there, but uh, it's, it's an incredible story. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the Smith Pond mystery. Right? And uh, um, so let me introduce a couple of guys here that were involved in this case, and they're just as much at fault for this case as I am. <laughs> and there's Alan Strickland back there and Ken Warren on the phone over here. Ken is actually the one who, uh, and Alan were the, the two guys who, uh, who told me about this story. I happened to be working on an archaeological dig at the Shaker Museum under the direction of Dr. David Starbuck. We were doing uh, some archaeology there on historic archaeology at, at the Shaker Museum. And uh, these guys knew that I was a scuba diver. Alan had read my book, and he knew that uh, I had some dive skills. So they told me about this particular story. And so on, in May, uh, Alan and Ken had a question. And usually in an archaeological project or a historical project, when you have a mystery, you should ask a question first. What's, what's the question? Well, what, do you, what do you need to know? And in this case, Ken stated that there was an old barge at the bottom of Smith Pond that uh, he remembered uh, being there as a kid, and uh, he liked it to be investigated. He wanted to figure out what it was. So uh, you know, I had dive shells, and I could dive in ponds and lakes and rivers and things in the oceans. So uh, we decided we were going to check this thing out. So uh, could we dive the pond? Well, yeah, I can dive ponds pretty easy. And uh, could we locate it, and uh, could we investigate it? Uh, and could it be somehow connected to the Shakers? Because uh, Ken told me this is a pretty old boat, it had been there for a long time. His uncle had seen it in the bottom of the pond many years ago and remembered it being there, what, 1947? 1947. So that, that's pretty old. So at a minimum, it's probably a historic artifact. Whether it's an archaeological artifact, mm, maybe, maybe not. Uh, anything over, like, over 100 years old is generally considered to be an archaeological resource. Less than 100 and between 50 is usually a historic artifact. So it's probably historic, but it could be archaeological. We'll just have to wait and see. So Alan and Ken knew about this barn for many years, and they wondered what it was used for and how it got there. So we were going to try and figure this thing out. So where is Smith Pond? Most of you probably know where Smith Pond is, I would assume. But there's some interesting things about Smith Pond I could point out. So here is you know, Smith Pond down here. Uh, this is a piece of private property within the, uh, the boundaries of uh, the Smith Pond Shaker Forest, which is part of the Upper Valley Land Trust. And on the outside over here, on these sides over here, this is all owned by the state now, and it's a wildlife management area. So there's some, this, is, this is a really nice piece of property. If you haven't had a chance to go up there, there's some really cool little trails to go visit. Uh, the Shaker Museum is over here. Uh, there are trails that take off right from the Shaker Museum uh, that go up, uh, up up these hills, and there's absolutely beautiful places to hike there. So if you haven't had a chance to go to the Shaker Museum, please do so. So this is 
a little bit dark. The uh, but uh, back up one. here is here is Smith Pond, and here is the Shaker Museum, and here is uh, Shaker the Enfield Center, and uh, uh, Half Mile Pond is right over in here somewhere. Uh, there's George Pond. And Smith Pond is right here. So on the this little point of land that's just sticking out, and I'm, I apologize for this uh, this uh, picture image uh, as dark as it is. There's a little point of land that sticks out here called Baker Point, and just off Baker Point, in about 10 feet of water and about 40 feet from shore, is where this little this thing is. Whether we're going to call it a boat or not, <laughs> I'm hoping you can tell me, help me fill in the blanks on what this thing might have been used for and how it whether it's a boat, whether it's a sled, whether it's a barge. I'm not convinced one way or the other exactly what this thing is yet. Even though we've done a whole bunch of dives on it and done a lot of documentation, I'm still not quite convinced what it is. Maybe you can help me with that. So, a bit of geology about Smith Pond here. Uh, south of Ascoma Lake, the land rises about 1,700 feet in elevation. Uh, on the Mont... Uh, is that, how you put it? Uh, is that how you pronounce that? Plateau. There are a number of small bodies of water being Half Mile Pond, Smith Pond, and the Lily Ponds. The uh, Lily Ponds uh, are oftentimes in historical records confused with Smith Pond. Um, so when you read historical documents, you'll say, oh, the Lily Ponds, well, or Mountain Pond. Well, Mountain Pond and Smith Pond are really the same pond. Would you agree with that, Alan? Yes. He's done a lot of historical uh, uh, investigation on this particular case. So Smith Pond is about 63 acres in size and about 35 feet deep and its deepest spot. Now I haven't been down to the deepest spot, but maybe this summer we're going to do that. Uh, one of the things we need to do this summer is is look closer to the dams to see if we can find any more artifacts in that general area. Maybe there's another boat down there. You never know. Uh, the al area also contains uh, a number of old shallow mines, crystal. Uh, quartz crystals, is that right, Ken? Is that what you right. think they are? Quartz? And, uh, and some pretty significant large uh, rock outcroppings. So the Smith Pond could be considered a great pond. Who's familiar with the Great Ponds Act? You ever heard of the Great Ponds Act? Tell me a little bit about it. 10 acres or more in size. Yeah. Naturally occurring body of water. Mm -hmm. And what was significant about the Great Ponds Act? Do you remember? Well, I'm thinking of it from my profession, so probably not when they originated. So one of the things about the Great Ponds Act is, uh, and this was an act that was put into place uh, when Massachusetts Bay Colony was in existence. It wasn't in America, and none of that stuff happened. But the uh, the colony, the Commonwealth of, uh, of uh, the Colony of Massachusetts, they wanted they wanted to make sure that nobody, one single person, controlled all the water rights. So they said, okay, well, let's set up this little act called the Great Ponds Act. So what they said was, you, you can own a body of water that's less than 10 acres in size, and you can own the whole thing. You can own the submerged lands, the water, the whole thing, you can have that. But if it's greater than 10 acres in size, and less than 80 acres in size, that would be called a great pond. So Smith Pond would be considered a great pond. But if it's over 80 acres in size, it's no longer a pond, it's a lake. So when I say, you know, Tell me the difference between a pond and a lake. People say, oh, it's the size. It's the size of the, pond, the, the body of water. Well, generally true. But a great pond is anything between 10 acres and 80 acres in size. And that becomes critical because um, if you don't own the water and, you don't, and then you don't own the submerged lands underneath it, then who does? Well, the state does. So the state owns the bottom of the lake and they own the water. If it's great, greater than 80 acres in size or a great pond. Less than 80 acres in size, you can own it. Make sense? <coughs> so, sacred construction here, a couple of things I wanted to point out is canals. So this little map shows these little canals that attaching to these little bodies of water, and they go up to what this map calls the lily ponds. So here's this lily pond right here. This is actually Smith Pond. Would you agree with that, Alan? You think that's Smith Pond? As of today, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we might change our mind tomorrow, but it's, uh, today, yes. We're going to call it Smith Pond. But it did change because of the dams. It did change right. because that's of the dams. That's probably the reason of the size. difference. Right. Yeah. 
So what did we date this map as? 18, no, what did we say this one was? 1860 was the earliest. Yeah. Map. And, and the, but keep in mind, Smith, this is, if this is 1860, Smith, uh, the dam had already been, it was 20 years, uh, built in 1840, which, which this does not show uh, the average size of the Smith Pond, so. This was, 20, this was uh, 20 years after the dam had been put in. So today, if you, if you go to the Shaker uh, village, uh, these little mill ponds are still in existence. These canals are in existence. You can follow these canals. There are trails that follow these canals. There are little bridges that cross these canals. Uh, so there's some fascinating hiking to do out there. There's a couple signboards out there, interpretive signboards that will tell you what these things are. But you, you can visit a little bit of the history of the Shakers just by going out in the woods and seeing these things. But the whole purpose of all these canals, of course, was to bring water down from Smith Pond and the Lily Ponds to the Shaker Village and uh, In 1888, the Shakers, uh, did I, I missed a slide, let me back up a couple more. Yeah, here we go. Uh, in 1838, the Shakers uh, constructed a series of five dams and miles of canals to transport falling water to their mill ponds and a powerhouse. And they did that because the Shakers started, they, they, they clearly understood that, um, that uh, the things that they were making were very marketable. When the train came to Enfield here, uh, they saw a, a ready place, easy place, place for them to get their products on the train, get them down to Boston, and, and sell them and market them. And Shaker products were in high demand. So they, uh, the, their, the hats that they were making, the baskets they were making, a lot of these products that they were making were very marketable, and they were doing quite well. And uh, so having uh, a, a power source to provide uh, uh, for their machinery was, uh, was a good deal. The state of New Hampshire claimed that the Shakers built the dams illegally, and that was in an 1940, 1947 report. I'm not sure that's accurate, because uh, the Shakers, the best that I can understand, they actually owned the water rights, and they sold those water rights to the other villages. So they had to have some kind of ownership of it. So when the, this, uh, this uh, 1947 report came out, I don't think they did their homework. I think there's some mistakes in that. So the Shakers, I think, clearly had legal water rights. So we took a look at that one. Okay, in 1888, the Shakers uh, constructed major repairs to the dams at Smith Pond. It had been 48 years since the dams had been completed. High time to, to fix them up and get them in, in pretty good shape. And then in 1927, the Shakers, uh, the, the number of people, the number of Shakers who were at the village had significantly been reduced to, from the, in, the, in the past 10 years. So they had lots of buildings, they had lots of things to maintain and not very many people to do it. They needed to make a decision. So they decided to uh, sell all of their uh, holdings here in the Chosen Valley to the uh, Lost Select Missionary uh, Services for $25,000. Twenty-five thousand dollars back then was a lot of money. Is it okay if I copy? Absolutely, you go right ahead, sir. Yeah. And if, if you see anything that's not quite correct, make sure you tell me. I'd like to <laughs> correct it. In 1947, uh, the Las Lets, uh, under the direction of the state, uh, were told to make some repairs on the dance because they were in pretty bad shape. The Las Lets also uh, did. Uh, from what I understand, quite a bit of logging in the area up there around Smith Pond. In 2001, there were two private landowners with an interest in maintaining the water levels around Smith Pond, and they uh, they asked the state if they could make some repairs to the dams, which which they were able to do, and that was completed in 2009. Yeah. When they finished that. Quick question. Please. Yes. It was 1947 when the state said the dams were built illegal, yeah. but it tells us it left. Yeah, right. years later. <laughs> right. Why did they go on to La Salette? Why did the state prepare them if they thought that was there? The La Salette, well, the La had bought the whole thing. They bought Smith Pond, they bought everything in the Chosen Valley, bought everything in the shape. So they owned the dams. You know, oh, the so even if they were illegally built, they're still there. Okay. And that was an Army, from what I understand, that was an Army Corps of Engineers report. Isn't that right? You have a copy of it, right? Mm -hmm. 
and it says right in there, you know, not much is known about the dams of, of uh, Smith Pond. Well, actually, we, we didn't have too much problem finding quite a bit of information about the Smith Pond dams. And we didn't, we, we didn't have resources for the day. Okay. Award of the present year, uh, in 2015, the Upper Valley Land Trust buys much of the property surrounding Smith Pond, creating the Smith Pond Forest. Thank you very much for doing that. You guys did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> One parcel on the land uh, along the shores remains in private ownership, and uh, that's the Baker property that uh, we used a couple of times to uh, access the uh, little Baker Point there where we could go scuba dive. And that also has a conservation easement on it. Oh, it does. a land trust, so it's also protected. Oh, good. Yeah. The Baker's property. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. And the state of New Hampshire buys the former Shaker and Lost Electric properties, creating the uh, Lower Valley, uh, Shaker Valley, uh, Shaker State Wildlife Management Area. Thank you for the state of, of uh, New Hampshire for doing that. So that's in addition to the WMA that is south of the uh, property that uh, Upper, uh, Upper Valley Land Trust bought. Okay. And uh, uh, it, I mean, it, it's important to see that because there are two big chunks of land that were separated and that are now joined, if you will, by the Upper Valley Land Trust into one big preservation area. The whole ridge, if you look at it, is preserved. The whole Montcalm? Yeah. All the way to Interstate 89? Oh, yeah. Pretty well, close. Not, not 89, but close to that. I don't know. What are you doing? Uh, it's about all together the two WMAs and UBLT's property make up about a 6,000 acre forest block. Right. And so it's really all protected for wildlife habitat. That's right. Amazing. It's a wonderful thing. From my perspective, working in the National Park Service, when I see people set aside lands like that for conservation, it just it makes my heart <laughs> <laughs> Not just you. <laughs> On June the 8th, uh, Ken and Alan and I traveled up to Smith Pond with dive gear and snorkeling gear, and we hiked to Baker Point on the northeast side of the pond. We were looking for this, this thing right here. And using scuba gear, I found the boat using Ken's directions within just a few minutes, and it was in 10 feet of water and about 40 feet from shore. But in, in June of that year, the, the, uh, the lake was very tanny in color, and it's really hard to see. So when, when you see some of these pictures coming up, you say, gee, Dan, why don't you just take a great big giant picture from the surface and look down there and take <laughs> and visibility is like, you know, like six feet or seven feet. I couldn't really do that, which is why I had to build the model so you have a, an idea of what you're looking at. But the visibility is five to six feet, which is relatively poor. It might be good for Smith Pond. I don't know. Does it ever get any clearer than that? I don't know. I don't swim in it. <laughs> 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 It's actually pretty good water quality yeah. up there. Uh, no. In the summertime, there's an algae bloom in there. And, and so when the, uh, the tannin sort of disappears in the lake a little bit and it sort of settles out a little bit, then the algae comes in because the water temperature changes. Mm -hmm. And then we're back to five to six feet of visibility again. And instead of being like tea, looking like tea, now it looks greenish color. Mm. So the water temperature is about 52 degrees there, which is a little chilly. But with a good wetsuit, uh, we know you're in pretty good shape. So, and this sl slide again is not very bright, but uh, here's Baker's Point, there's Baker's house. And uh, right off this point right here is where the boat is, or that thing is. Alright, my wife drew this little diagram after we. Uh, we um, did a couple of dives on it, and hopefully my little model here is a close resemblance to what this thing is. But uh, a couple of things that were interesting to me right from the very get-go when I first saw it was this thing has these little, these, this little bow uh, thing here. I don't know what you would call that, but it's sort of like a sled. So when I first saw it, I said, oh, this thing is a sled. It, it must have been used on the ice or the snow, but my cohorts here said, no, 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 Dan, you know, it's got to be a boat. <laughs> it, it had to be some kind of a device that was used in the construction of the dam. Well, maybe that's true, um, and, but we'll, let's talk about that a little bit more. But uh, this is an artist's rend rendition of what it looks like. What these things in the back of the boat are back here, they're actually on the table over there, 
and they go right here on the back of this boat. This is the stern, and this is the bow. Uh, and this is the little transom, uh, that thing right there. But it's got some interesting things in it. But right from the very get-go, I said, oh, it looks to me like it's a sled. It also looks like it has a number of different uh, renditions, and it's been repurposed from a bunch of things because it's got some very old wood. The railings on this thing are very old. You look at them, they're just, they're really fragile. They look like they're 150 years old. And they really look old, and they're very, very dainty and very small. You wouldn't use that to push or pull this thing in any way. It had to be used for maybe a balance or something, but it definitely, it, it, it lacks structural integrity. So, this little, uh, these are pictures that I took uh, on June the 8th, and I'm gonna show you a video here in just a few minutes, but that piece right there is this piece right here. It's not exactly the rendition of it, you know, this is looking towards, um, I took the picture like I was right here and I took it in this direction. So if I was to follow this out, this would curve up into the, uh, into that little, this thing right here. And that is the, uh, the, 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 uh, the back of the boat here. We're gonna call it a boat. And you can see that little thing right here. That's, whoops. That thing right there is this piece, and this piece is that thing right there. Is it wood or iron? Yeah. <coughs> well, it's it's all wood. It's wood. Huh? It's all wood. Either you think, well, yes. Yeah, sort of, if you're going to hang a motor or put a paddle or an oar back there to steer to something, it's got to be stout. It has to be really strong. It isn't. <laughs> it, it's kind of weak, and you know, it, I would swim by with my fins, and and this thing would. Swing back and forth, so it's 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 not it's not structurally s strong. When you look at how it was built, it just doesn't look like it was really well built. So what would you use that thing for? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like more questions. <laughs> more questions, yeah, that's right. And uh, this is the uh, back end of the boat. This is that uh, this thing right here is that. This board right here is this piece right here. And that thing right there is this thing right here. What is it used? What would you use that thing for? The, the, that thing is actually sitting on the bench back there. Now you want to pick it up and show it to Yeah, you can look at it later, but what was that thing used for? Could, could it looks like there was maybe a piece of wood, like a four by four that went in in the middle of that thing, like right in there maybe. And there's another one right over here on this side of the boat, just like this one. So there are two of these things right next to each other. So this is uh, one of those unusual, uh, I think these were attached to the side of the the boat over here, and those are on the table back there too as well. And then uh, there's a bunch of these rocks that are sitting on uh, these these thwart pieces. So these are two by fours, and they're real two by fours. They're not one and three quarter by three and a half. They're mm -hmm. the real true two by fours, which tells you that they they were either milled on site or somebody manufactured them. But they're the real two by fours. You take a tape measure on them, they're two by four. And the same thing with these. Uh, Two by eights on the side. These are real true two by eights. They're not <coughs> milled down. So that tells us it's probably back there a little ways. It's not. They didn't buy them down at Home Depot. Deep, deep, deep right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is uh, one of those things that's on the back of the table again. What was it used for? Gosh, I don't know. Do you, anybody have any ideas what that could have been used for? Ask a question. Yes. Did one of your slides say plywood was used? Plywood was used. So it was used in that? Yeah. What plywood was not on these. No, 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 but in the in the that plywood. the plywood. Yeah, I'll show you. So when was plywood first manufactured? Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Well, it became commercially available later than the 1800s. Well, plywood was it was invented in 1840, but in 1880 you could buy plywood. Oh, really? Okay, but, I didn't know that. Well, think of veneer furniture. Veneer is just basically a rendition of what plywood is. But plywood had been invented for quite a long time. In the early 1900s, you could have gone into a store here in Lebanon and bought plywood. If you can believe that. Plywood was available. So when I first saw plywood on this thing, I went, uh oh, it, this thing's clearly historic. It's not archaeological. Yeah, that was my it's first It's a lot more too. modern. Yeah. And, and after doing a little research on plywood, I said, well, you know, this thing could still be Shaker. The Shakers could have used plywood. In, in a lot of the shaker furnishings, they used veneer. There was a lot of veneer that they used. Rocks. Uh, Ken said there was a bunch of rocks in this thing. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, there was. There was. This big giant rock was right here, and there was a great big hole in the bottom of the, of the thing. So maybe they used it for sinking it. That's what it looks like. Yeah. Or they could have filled the thing up with rocks, tried to float it over to the dam, and didn't make it. <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. Yeah. Put too many rocks in it. And you know, we already saw that thing, the transom. So <coughs> um, this is an unusual joint. This, what we're looking at here, this joint right here, and I'm sorry <coughs> that the picture is so fuzzy, is this joint right here. And how it fits in the bottom of the and uh, that thing right there is, a, is this, this skid right here. That thing right there. And that's a two by eight. And this thing sits right on top of that two by eight. So these, if you're a boat builder, you would, I would never build a, a joint like that. And we'll look at a couple other joints here in a few minutes that uh, tell us Bit of the story. Here's Alan coming out of the water, freezing, of course, which I was. And there I am coming out of the water, uh, not too far from where the boat is. The boat happens to be right behind me, right over in here. And there's a picture of Ken. Sorry, Ken, it's not a very bright picture there, but. Um, all right, visibility. Well, this is the kind of visibility we were looking at. I tried to take a picture of the boat in its entirety to give you a good perspective of what this thing is. And that's the kind of visibility it had. So you really couldn't, couldn't take a very good picture of it. But in a second here, I'm going to show you some dive video where you'll be able to swim around the whole thing here. Oops, let me back up. This is that railing. Mm -hmm. Now I'm swimming down this side of it here like this. And those are the thwarts. Crazy joint on the corner there. I'm going to show you some pictures of that here in a few minutes. And uh, there's the uh, stern. What was that used for? I have no idea. Maybe been a guy sometime. Could be, yeah. Just the length. Big part? Just the length. 16 feet, 3 inches. 
by five feet, six inches. It, I took this video before we touched anything. I just wanted to make sure we had everything well documented before I moved in because there's a big rock. Here's those unusual joints in the uh, in how this thing is put together. that those things but oddly enough the uh, the two by fours don't touch the bottom just like this this thing here so why would you do that I don't know the bottom is plywood or do you know the bottom is plywood it is plywood. and do you know if it was sealed through the frame all around so it would be watertight it's not can't tell. watertight at all it's no? pretty loose there's no, I, several you, sections there with little gaps right, but you have to account for damage incurred over yeah. time it's pr it may have been assembled as a uh, um, a tight fit so that it would float. Yeah. And that would make it a raft that might have some utility for transporting stuff across the pond. Yeah, there's these little gaps in, in the uh, wood where it was cut so that those things fit into those little gaps. Green paint, that's right. There's that odd looking joint. If you're building a boat, or even a raft for that matter, I wouldn't build a joint like that. I just wouldn't do that. And if I did, I would, I would brace the corner somehow to make sure there was structural integrity in the corner of the thing. Yeah. There wasn't. So when I built this thing, I actually built those same kind of joints so that you could see what the joint looks like. It's a furniture joint. What, what is it nailed? It's nailed. They're all nailed? All the well, time. not all of them. Some of them have a bolt that goes through a, a, a metal bolt and you can see it. And I'll show you some pictures when we get to the side as to how things are bolted on the side. It certainly doesn't look like it was made to carry very heavy things on it like they would in like a stone boat or, or something. That wouldn't... Yeah. The only thing I can think of is possibly bringing over cement forms, which are wood. Mm. You put that in the boat, you know, more wood. Possibly they had this front end uh, with boards so the guys could come right up to the dam and walk up onto the high areas, like a landing craft, mm. World War II. Mm. And that, I think that's what these things back here might manipulate and put pressure on these boards. You know, they could change that angle, but that's a theory. Mm. So here's the bow and uh, the connection points, these are all metal, that's metal. That's metal. These are metal bolts that go through this thing. These are not metal. These are wood. And and that, that's a pretty robust piece of wood there. But, uh, the, the attachment point here is, is made with metal. The spacing is similar to that of a ladder? I can't tell really. That's just an idea. You know, it's sort of, a, yeah, sort of like a ladder. Well, like, like this. Right, you know? right. Yeah. And I didn't put enough of these in here, but there's one missing here and one missing there. So there's a there's one, two, three, and then there's another one right here. So there's four. So I'm missing one, one piece there. It, so I cleared away some of the sediment. There's plywood. Yeah. And there's this crazy looking joint, this thing right here. So that this 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 whole bow thing looks like it. It, it's supposed to articulate somehow. It doesn't look like it's attached very well at all. It looks like it's designed to, to maneuver almost like a hinge, but that's not what it is, I don't think. And uh, these, each of these two by fours is mounted or, or uh, attached with this crazy looking chevron type of a, of a washer of some type. And then there's a bolt right here that goes through the, the two by eight or the two by 10 into this thing. And that's a wood screw, it's uh, just. It's a, it's a metal screw of some kind. Right. And, it, and it has a square head on it, not a octagon or, or a, uh, 
doesn't have a slot in it for screw. Mm -hmm. it, it's a pit. Mm -hmm. So if you took a close look at this thing right here, that would be square. You know, there's that crazy looking joint. You know, you look at this thing here, you go, well, you're a bolt builder, why would you do, put a, make a joint like that? And if you did make a joint like that, you certainly want to brace the corner somehow. So that it doesn't, the joint doesn't just fall apart. So there's that crazy looking joint, and here's a, the same joint in a piece of furniture. This is, happens to be a piece of shaker furniture at that. Too. So then you have to do that, <laughs> you just adapted it. What's that? <laughs> so then you have to do that, you adapted it. Yeah, well, they, yeah. <laughs> so here's Alan, um, August 29th, uh, did another dive here, and here's that we, artifact just coming out of the water. And you can see this, 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 the shape of this thing. Something sat in there, right here. And what that is, this is a, this is metal. And it, and it's, and it's braced against this thing here. So something sat in there, like maybe you put a, a four by four across this whole thing, and maybe that was used to drag the thing across the ice. I don't know. But if that is the case, then the, the structural integrity of this needed to be a whole lot more, there needed to be a whole lot more strength. There needed to be some, some, uh, some support bracing in here, something like that, if you're gonna drag this thing across the snow or the ice. And uh, that, uh, this thing here is this piece right here. Alan's trying to hold it up. And one of the pictures we didn't capture there, Alan, was you holding up that that 16 foot length of of, uh, of a. Of, it's actually this. There's a uh, a little uh, rail or a little. What would we call that? A runner. A runner. Yeah, a runner that goes across the bottom of this sort of a ski looking thing. It goes across the bottom of that. When I saw that, that told me he said snow, yeah. snow or ice, because that. Whoop, that would be a, what you'd put on the bottom of the sled to track across the snow or the ice. So it, I think one of the functions with this thing was, was clearly snow or ice. It might have had other functions too. Maybe it was used in the summertime as a raft. You, know, you put some logs underneath this, some great big logs about this big around, put a bunch of them across the top of this thing, then you could float it over to the dam and you could put cement mixers and you could put rocks and all kinds of stuff. Or you could put barrels on it and somehow attach barrels to the bottom of this thing. What we got? Also known as a party bar. That's what it was. The original pontoon boat. <laughs> yeah, the original pontoon boat. Yeah. Okay, so we we registered this thing as an archaeological site with the state. We submitted a report to them. David Truly is a state archaeologist. He happened to be visiting uh, the Shaker Museum here on hey, this crazy thing. He happened to be visiting the archaeological site, the Shaker Museum there, so I talked to him about it. And he said, well, I'll send you all the paperwork. We'd love to see it. So we submitted a report with the state to, to log this thing as an archaeological site. One thing I have to do to finish this thing off, though, is I have to, to write a conclusionary statement, which basically tells us, tells them what we think it is and how old it is. And uh, I've been reluctant to do that because I'm still a little bit unsure as to what this thing is. Yeah. So could it be a portable sawmill? Eh, I don't think so. It needs to be a lot more rugged if it's going to be holding that kind of material, this kind of stuff. If you're going to be dragging logs across this thing of this size, it's gonna to have to be a whole lot more rugged than this thing. Could it be a stone boat? Well, if you're gonna be hauling rocks on this thing, again, it needs to be a whole lot more stout than this thing. Could it be a John boat? The, the one thing that uh, this doesn't have is it doesn't have much freeboard. So if you put this thing in the water, it's gonna be uh, just the way it is, just the, if, you, if we happen to float this thing out, it would be out of the water about this much. Well, one person standing in this thing would probably sink it <laughs> because it, it doesn't have it. This thing has a displacing hull. Mm -hmm. It can float on the water, it can displace water. 
this thing doesn't displace water. It just there's, and when you look at it, you go, how can this thing displace? There's no there's no hull. There's, right. there's no structure for it to displace water. And if you're going to build a boat with the, you need to have these little knees, which are which are things that you would put right here, these little corner braces to support a side the side of the boat so that they could displace water or keep keep water out of the inside of the boat. And it doesn't have any of those either. Could it be an ice sled? I'm tending to think that, in my opinion, that this was definitely used for snow and ice. Could have had other purposes too, but I think it was definitely used for snow and ice. Could it be a bateau? Mm -hmm. Could be. But look at the structural integrity of that thing compared to what we have. This thing here, this this boat here is, this is really a boat. It really is a a, a barge with uh, some, some some substantial construction quality to it. There doesn't appear to be a displacement hull. There doesn't appear to be adequate frame or flotation for it to be a raft. It appears to have a, a transom for a motor, or maybe it was used as a, as a uh, device for a sweeper to steer, steer the thing and to move it across. And when I was working in Grand Teton National Park, uh, the, uh, the, the big 33-foot rafts that they had there had a sweep on either end. Uh, these were rafts that would float down the Snake River. And uh, in still water, they could use those things as propulsion to actually move the boat mm -hmm. forward, the raft forward. So could that be the use of this thing? It looks a little flimsy for that kind of thing. It does have rails made of hardwood, so uh, it uh, could be used to track uh, on ice and snow. And if it is a shaker boat, the shakers had a great reputation for inventing and building practical devices. Uh, we're not certain of this of the age of this thing yet, but it, in my opinion, uh, because it has, has had, it had it has had multiple functions over the years. It's had multiple uses and it's been repurposed. It could be shaker. It could be from the nineteen early nineteen hundreds shakers. And the reason why I say that is because of the age of the wood, especially on these little rails. There's some pieces of wood on this thing that are just really old. And they, they look like they're 100 years old. So, boat, sled, raft could be a flotation device. Uh, we could have used 55 gallon barrels to, to float this thing. It could use, have used cork squares, and I'll show you some pictures of those here in a bit, a few minutes. But all of these things would have been readily available after World War I and World War II. There's plenty of surplus barrels floating around all over the place. There's plenty of cork floating around after World War I and World War II. And uh, you know, we've already talked about plywood here. Uh, two by six and two by eight milled wood, true milled uh, two by sixes and two by eights and two by fours. Uh, and it looks like it had been repurposed. I don't think it goes back to the 1880. The Shakers did do some reconstruction on the dam in, the 18, in 1888. Perhaps it goes back that far. Well, I don't know about that one. I, I, that would be a bit of a stretch. It would be a, uh, be a bit of a stretch. So what do you think? Bateau, cork flotation, floating it on logs. You could put barrels underneath it. What do you think? We're still <laughs> the cross beams that you're showing in this don't support the bottom. They don't support the bottom, and that's, that's the way. True on the, that's on the actual that's one? true on the actual thing. So there's it a gap. Look like it was made to be a, a, a boat. Well, I, more like first a I said, the other thing I thought of when we first saw it was, ah, oh, it's the side of a building. It's a, it's a wall. They took down this wall from an old building, put it in the water, and tried to float it around. Maybe a bunch of kids had a lot of fun with it. But then, but then this is. Two, two or an eight, it's, it's whoever manufactured this thing here, they sort of knew what they were doing, but it, it's more for, it looks like it's more for decoration than, than actual structural integrity. I can't believe the shakers would build something that wasn't structurally strong enough to do whatever it was supposed to do. The shakers were incredibly ingenious. When they built something, they had a specific purpose in mind for it. And they were very practical about the things that they built. They, they were very ingenious people. They had all kinds of inventions. 
that uh, they patented and, and did quite well with. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to um, to carbon date something like that to find out how old it is? Well, that's too young for carbon dating. You're, you're probably better off using dendrology, which is, would be taking a sample of the wood and then uh, if you can figure out if it's localized wood, local wood or not, and then match it up to a certain time frame so that the wood could be 60, 80, 100 years old, 120 years old. Uh, carbon dating, you, you got to go a little bit further back. Is there any way to look at the hardware that was used on it and sort of try and figure out when that kind of hardware would have been commonly used? In well, we have some hardware right up there. Yeah. If you can make any sense out of it. Good point. Uh, it's, yeah. pretty it's pretty degraded. It's pretty degraded. It's pretty rusty. Yeah. Yeah. Since you got it declared an archaeological site, is that what allowed you to remove these pieces? We asked the state if we could manipulate the site to, and take things out to take a look at it. All those things are going back into the lake next summer once really? we're done looking at them to make sure that, yeah, we're going to put them back where we found them. Because that's the best thing. A hundred years from now, somebody's probably going to come across this thing and say, what the heck is this thing yeah. going down here? Why are these parts missing? <laughs> yeah. The fact that it's underwater also preserves it. Wood yeah. sustains water much it's better. It's actually than below the ice level. So the ice didn't compress it. You know, I've been on some shipwrecks on uh, Lake Superior where the ice is 20 feet thick and the, the wreck of this boat is in 15 feet of water and the ice just smushed this boat yeah, down. Right. Flat. The whole back bay in Boston is built on pilings that are wood into the marsh that used to be there. And they are actually being destroyed gradually because the water level is dropping and they're incurring some serious expenses fixing that as a result. Rising. Well, the water, no, know the water about table there is, uh, is <laughs> depleting. That's oh. an observation. I don't know the reason. Oh. Dan, we, we checked with the last elect to see if they had any records, and evidently a lot of their records went to Massachusetts and it was burned in a fire. So we kind of got the bad trail there. But uh, my uncle. Norman Warren did actually see the work up there in 1947, and he said that the boat appeared after the job was done. So, but he's trying to recall back, you know, he's 87 or 88. Uh, he seemed to be pretty good about it, but that's another theory, you know. Did they scuttle this on purpose and they used it or maybe transport forms and everything? Uh, but. We need somebody that was like in the 90s that actually worked on it. That would be somebody in town must have known about it because <laughs> uh, it, it was a big job and everything. Could there have been plywood over the whole top of it and taken off? Did you see any like nailed holes in anything? We didn't see anything in the in the in the in these two by fours, the tops of these two by fours, and it doesn't appear as though anything was was put on top of these. I'm just thinking if something was on top, then that would support <coughs> well, buckets or something like yeah. that. Yeah, if it if it if it hauled wood or something, right. you just take whatever wood you're taking over to the dam, and you just lay it across here and then take it over to the dam. But it doesn't look like there was anything permanent attached to the top of this, like a deck, right. a decking of some kind. At least I didn't see any evidence of that. Whatever this was used for, it kind of it seems like maybe it was built for a short-term purpose, you know, just to achieve whatever it was designed for and then, because the craftsmanship doesn't really look up to, you know, it doesn't look like it was built with the care that it would need to last for a long time. It looks like a piece of furniture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fascinating. The, you're saying the plywood is not nailed to the cross piece. The plywood, this plywood on the bottom was not nailed to these things. And what holds it? I, mean, I don't know how big the sheets were, but it's 16 by 5. This just, just, like this, just like this beam here is. That, that, that's shaped in the front. It's carved up. Is that it is. That's exactly the way it is. So it's designed to be moved in that direction, yep. whether it's on snow or water or whatever. Right? Yep. And then it had these tiny little, little uh, rails that in addition to this thing, there's a tiny little rail here that went right across this top of this thing. Sort of like a keel on a boat. 
And kind of a background, there was no road leading to this dam. And it probably would have cost a lot of money to cut trees and all this. So they had to go across the water with some things. And there's reports at the state that they were using horses to haul cement in. In fact, the, there was a horseshoe in the top of the old dam when they got done. It was in memory of this horse who lost the shoe. <laughs> You've probably seen it. Uh, but now there's a road right through this dam. But back then, it would have been a big deal with equipment. So they had to go across. And probably, what, a 10 minute boat ride to get over there or less. Uh, so, Dan, yeah, we swam over there in less than 10 minutes. Yeah. So we, uh, Alan and I went out there with the snorkel gear. We drove in there all the way to where that first earthen fill, fill dam is. We put on our gear there, and within 10 minutes, we were right at the boat. It's a, it's a nice short swim. And all of these artifacts we took out of them, we put them on a little flotation device and easily floated them back to where our vehicle was to get them out of there. So next summer you're gonna survey the entire rest of the pond, right? Yeah. Find out what else <laughs> is there. Find out if there's any more mysteries to mess with. But if you any thoughts or ideas that you have about its purpose or its ideas, or talk to your you know, your uncles or would it be used to move stuff on the ice and maybe this front part was to sort of block the snow or to clear the snow ahead of it? But uh, knows if you if you're carting, once the ice is on, it, it becomes something that you can... You can easily push this thing across yeah, the ice. Yeah. yeah. Or if you had horses out there on the ice, would horses go out on the ice without any problem? Shakers hauled with oxen across, yeah, right? Oxen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Stone across the thing. If you were going to pull it across the ice with oxen, wouldn't you have <clears throat> some kind of stout? Uh, I would think member so. Member to attach the cable or rope to. Yeah. And you haven't seen anything like that. Nothing like that. That's really and it just doesn't look structurally sound <clears throat> to be dragging this thing across the mud. Yeah. Or dragging, dragging across snow and ice where there's a whole lot less friction. Well, maybe, yeah. but, but even snow and ice are not yeah. flat, really. Right. Uh, right. Undulations of the ice, and you know, you're going Every across. Every time there. I try to skate, I figure that out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Want to mention this? Oh yeah, sure. This is a piece of rope that was found on the on the vessel, and it was it still got a knot tied onto it. So we took it off. You can see it's not very stout. That one, we found that in right over in here. In the mud. There were uh, along the side of the boat, uh, the sled here, there were, uh, if you could pick those things up there, Alan, and took. There are these uh, pieces of wood that went across the top of this thing, and they had holes in them about this big. Which one is that? I don't got holes in them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these? Yep. That's okay. Yeah. So that would have, this thing here would have been. Like this, with a hole about that big around. Running ropes through to lash things to the top of it. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought too. Did you check on their? I know there was a, I think it was called the Shaker Mountain Wire Company, and they used to sell to a lot of people on 4A. When I first got my real estate license in the early 80s, people were buying water from them. They had to stop because of lead paint. I think all the water came out of Smith Pond. And when I first saw the announcement, I thought, oh, I wonder if this was something to do with a water company. Well, Could be. Maybe they, used, uh, maybe they used this to, to cut ice out of Smith Pond. Okay. But if the Shakers are going to do that, why not cut ice out of Smith Pond? I don't know if it was that, but I know that they had a lot of people 
actually, I just remember actually, I don't remember who we had to call, but he, you know, it's like buying from the municipality. Yeah. So you're selling a house, you had to change the account. And I know that it all came down, as I remember. Do you remember, Ken? Did your parents ever get water from, I'm pretty sure it was called the Shaker Mountain Water Company. No, that it was, was groundwater they got. Yeah. You mean up near the did. canal where they live? Well, I didn't know if your parents got, I know a lot of people on, you know, the upper side of 4A, but once in a while you find people on the lower side. Yeah. But my understanding was the reason the whole thing stopped was the lead paint bringing the uh, lead pipe bringing the water down through. I think we found some of that pipe up there. It's actually, actually I didn't know here. about the yeah, water company though. The paint is really interesting. Yeah. Paint I always wondered what that was. It's about six inch diameter. Looks like it Yeah, because be I think it came down, you know, and then went off because a lot of houses yeah. on 4A were yeah. serviced by yeah. it. So this is uh, this is what was used to uh, to fashion the bottom of this thing. You can see that the kind of plywood it is. Are you talking to Michael's Connor? 